in five, four, three. Welcome back. We're going to pick up where we left off with the beginning of Act Two of Hamlet. When we um, last spoke and we last saw Polonius, um, we got some hint of what he was like as a person by his relationship to his family. The fact that he gave Laertes a lot of advice about the way he was supposed to behave in Paris and the fact that he ordered his daughter to cease seeing or speaking to Hamlet in any way. Um, we got the impression that he's not a very trust Ing guy, and that probably, like most people who do not trust very much, he's probably not very trustworthy. We get a l stronger um, indication of this in this scene because despite the fact that he has given his son very strict instructions about how he is to behave in Paris, he does not expect him to pay attention to that, and instead he sent off his friend Reynaldo to go and spy on him. In fact, not only is he to go and spy on Laertes to find out how he's really behaving in um, uh, Paris, but he also suggests that what the way that Reynaldo ought to do this is by going and finding other Danish guys in Paris and hinting that Laertes is prone to a lot of things like gambling and drinking and messing around with women of easy virtue. And the idea of doing this, of, of actually lying, of telling these stories, is so that if in fact Laertes has been acting like this, the Danish guys will then say this. And this is what um, Polonius suggests. I know the gentleman. I saw him yesterday or the other day or then or then with such or such. And as you say, there was a gaming. There I overtook in his rouse. There I fell out at tennis or perchance. I saw him enter such a house of sale, vitalis it, a brothel or so forth. See you now. Your bait of falsehood takes this carp of truth, and thus do we of wisdom and of reach with windlasses and with assays of bias by indirections find directions out. So by my former lecture and advice you shall you, my son. Polonius, when he says the bias, he's to assays of bias, he's making a reference to bowls, which is um, it's lawn bowling or like bocce ball. And what he's suggesting is that rather than shoot the pool bowl directly for that pocket, that what he try is a bank shot. Tell these lies and we'll find the truth out. Uh, this is a person who's more bent than a hairpin. Um, and that is the way he is. This is um, the way he is in the bosom of his family. It's certainly the way he is in politics, and if he is indeed Claudius' right-hand man, that tells you something more about Claudius as well. Um, he then hears from Ophelia. Ophelia comes in screaming, and she says that Hamlet has come in, and he looks pretty terrible. Um, that he has no hat upon his head, his stockings fouled, unguarded and down jivet to his ankle, pale as his shirt, his knees knocking each other, and with a look so piteous and purport as if he had been loosed out of hell to speak of horrors, he comes before me. And Polonius immediately assumes that this is because Hamlet has gone mad for love. That's not a completely unreasonable assumption because people did, um, were thought to have gone mad, literally mad for love, and that he's got a bad case of lover's melancholy. Hamlet is showing up with all of his clothing loose. You must remember that clothing at this time doesn't, there's no such thing as zippers, there's no Velcro, and buttons tend to be just decorative items, and so clothing tends to be tied or pinned together. And so Hamlet's doublet is open, his stockings, which should be tied up, are hanging down, and they're showing a lot of bare leg. He has no hat on his head, which doesn't seem normal, and Ophelia is concerned. Um, he says, you know, she says that he looks as though he's been loosed out of hell. Well, he's certainly just been talking to the ghost. One of the questions, as everybody always wants to know, is Hamlet really crazy or is he just faking? And also, what is this? Is this Hamlet starting to act like an antic, you know, doing his antic disposition? Of course, we can never really find out because we don't see it. We just hear Ophelia's report of it but it certainly might seem as though he's beginning to act crazy. And if he's doing that, then he's, instead of choosing to just start in public, he's gone to Ophelia first, So because he knows that Ophelia will immediately go to her father, and as soon as 
her her father knows her father will be like leasing billboard space, so everybody will know about it. Um, Polonius does leap to the conclusion that this is um, because Hamlet is in love with Ophelia and has been thwarted. And he's very upset about it. And then Polonius asks her, what? Have you given any, him any hard words of late? You know, what? Did you say anything bad to him? And Ophelia has to say, well, no, daddy, but you told me not to talk to him anymore. And Polonius has to admit, yeah, that's right, I did. Um, and he says he's sorry. You know, he thought that uh, Hamlet had bad intentions, um, but that that's a typical thing for older people to be suspicious. Okay, so that's what he says to his daughter. And he says he's going to go and tell the king um, that they actually know. In the beginning of scene two, uh, scene two begins a lot of the theatrical references in this play. Um, we have the opening, um, the beginning of our acquaintance with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Ra Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, very similar, almost like Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Um, you may know that Tom Stoppard has a play called Rosencrantz and Guildenstern Are Dead, which is basically Hamlet from Rosencrantz and Guildenstern's point of view. Um, since Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have hardly any idea of what's going on, um, they're really massively confused. Um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern have been sent for. They are Hamlet's um, school buddies. They're his friends from early youth. And the idea is supposed to be they spend some time with Hamlet, they try to find out what's eating Hamlet, and then they report it to the king and queen. Um, the Queen thinks that this will work because, of course, they've known, they've known him for so long. Um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern do seem to be kind of interchangeable. They say, yes, we'll do it. Um, you could have simply commanded us, but we will do it freely. And um, the King says, thanks, Rosencrantz and gentle Guildenstern. And um, the Queen says, thanks, Rose uh, Guildenstern and gentle Rosencrantz. And sometimes that's done as though Claudius addresses them by the wrong names and then she corrects him. So it's hard to tell them apart, pretty much. Um, Polonius and also the ambassadors that have been sent to Norway come back in. Uh, Polonius says that he has figured out what has made Hamlet crazy. The good news comes from Norway, and the good news is that Norway, the king of Norway found out what Fortinbras was up to and made him stop. Fortinbras said, gee, I'm sorry, I'm not going to attack Denmark. Bad, Fortinbras, bad. And so his uncle has given him some money, and he's going to go attack Poland instead, so he has to attack somebody. And he asks, oh, by the way, can I go through Denmark on the way? And Claudius says, well, sure. Now, I don't know about you, but this strikes me as being not necessarily so bright, but um, it does explain why Fortinbras just happens to be there at the end of the play. Um, when Polonius has to tell them about um, Hamlet being mad, he's very reluctant to actually spit it out. And we get some kind of sense of his, um, his tendency toward verbiage, his tendency to just talk in this windy way. My legion, madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night, night, and time and t is time, we're nothing but to waste night, day, and time. Therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. Your noble son is mad. Mad call I it for to define true madness, what it is it to be anything else but mad, but let that go. So he spends a lot of time saying that it's boring when people talk for too long. Gertrude seems to be offended at the idea that her son is being referred to as mad, and um, Polonius says that he's not um, using any art at all, he's not trying to fluff this up, and that um, Hamlet indeed seems to be crazy. Mad, let us grant him then, and now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say, the cause of this defect, for this effect defective comes by cause. Thus it remains, and the remainder thus perpend. I have a daughter, have while she is mine, who in her duty and obedience Mark hath given me this. Now gather and surmise, and he's got the letter from Hamlet to Ophelia. To the celestial and my soul's idol, the most beautified Ophelia, 
That's an ill phrase. A vile phrase. Beautified is a vile phrase, but you shall hear. Thus, he doesn't like the word beautified. Beautified is just another way of saying to the most beautiful Ophelia, but Polonius does not like it because it suggests that Ophelia wears a lot of makeup. And then Polonius reads Hamlet's ver verses. Doubt thou the stars are fire, doubt that the sun doth move, doubt truth to be a liar, but never doubt I love. O oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers, I have not art to reckon my groans, but I love thee best, O oh, most best, believe it, adieu, thine evermore, dear lady, while this machine is to him Hamlet. Very strange, Hamlet refers to his body as a machine, even in his love letters. Then they ask, how... Did you th what did you think when Hamlet started to um, woo Ophelia? And Polonius says, well, what do you think of me? Well, as of a man faithful and honorable, I would fain prove so. But what might you think if I had seen this hot wi love on the wing? As I perceived it, I must tell you that before my daughter told me. What might you or my dear majesty or queen here think if I had played the desk or table book? Or given my heart a winking, mute and dumb, or looked upon this love with idle sight, what might you think? No, I went round to work, and my young mistress thus I did to speak. Lord Hamlet is a prince, out of thy star, this must not be. What he says is, I told her that Hamlet is too good for her, and that she should not try to date him. Uh, we know that that's not true. We've seen him lie. And we now see that um, we, we do know for a fact that he's lied because we saw what he actually said. Again, more information about Polonius. Um, Polonius and Hamlet have a brief interchange. Polonius thinks that he can sift all of this out, and they're going to, he makes the suggestion that what he's going to do is the king and he will hide behind an heiress. Polonius is a real thing about hiding behind heiresses or tapestries, and ultimately he's going to hide behind just one too many heiresses. He suggests they hide behind the heiress, leave Ophelia out, and see what Hamlet says to her. So that's going to be left up for later. Um, Hamlet manages to yank Polonius's legs a lot and pretend to be crazy and then when Rosencrantz and Guildenstern comes, come in um, this is when the theatrical references really take off. There are a lot of references to fortune. Um, the fortune theater was the theater of the rival company of Shakespeare, um, the Admiral's Men. Shakespeare's company was the Chamberlain's Men, and their theater was the Globe. So every time you see Fortune or Globe in this part, you may want to think about the Fortune Theater and the Globe Theater. Um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern particularly are associated with Fortune. Um, Hamlet can't trust anybody. They're lousy actors. Hamlet tries to get them to spit it out. In fact, they suspect, they try to suggest that what's bugging Hamlet is ambition, but they're sort of imposing their own agendas onto him. They are ambitious, he is not, really. And he start, starts to try to find out, first of all, what the, why they're here, and can he trust them. In the beaten way of friendship, what make you at Elsinore? To visit you, my lord, no other occasion beggar that I am. I am even poor in thanks, but I thank you. And sure, dear friends, my thank is to say too dear a halfpenny. Were you not sent for? Is it your own inclining? Is it a free visitation? Come, come, deal justly with me. Come, come, nay speak. <clears throat> what should we say, my lord? Anything but to the purpose. You were sent for, and there is a kind of confession in your looks which your modesties have not craft enough to color. I know the good king and queen have sent for you. To what end, my lord? That must you teach me. But let me conjure you by the rights of our fellowship, by the constancy of our youth, by the obligation of our ever-preserved love, and by what more dear a better proposer we can charge you withal, be even and direct with me, whether you were sent for or no. Psst. What say you? Well, that's lousy improvisation, isn't it? Rosencrantz leans over and tries to ask Guildenstern what he should say. Um, Hamlet tries to get them to tell him 
um, of their own inclination. And because they will not, he knows he cannot trust them. He cannot trust Polonius. He cannot trust Ophelia because he cannot trust her not to talk to Polonius. He cannot trust his mother. And now he can't trust his two friends. The question will be, who can he trust? And ultimately, he will find somebody that he can trust indeed, but it will not be Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Hamlet starts talking about how he's lost all of his mirth, and he also makes some references in this to the structure of the globe. I have of late, but wherefore I know not, lost all my mirth, forgone all custom of exercise, that this goodly frame, the earth, seems to me a sterile promontory. This most excellent canopy, the air, look you, this brave overhanging firmament, this majestical roof fretted with golden fire, why it appeareth nothing to me but a foul and pestilent congregation of vapors. And when Hamlet gestures like this, the globe's roof um, over the stage was covered with a sky, a painting of the sky, and also um, fretted with golden fire, divided into little golden, a golden checkerboard pattern. And so Hamlet is in fact referring to the stage roof as, in, in, as he is also referring to the real sky, both and the same thing. Therefore, the audience are also in a kind of theater, a theater of the world. Everyone always remembers Hamlet's speech about what a piece is man, of, is man what a piece of work is man, that um, it's a sort of a renaissance celebration of humans, and yet hear how this ends. What a piece of work is a man, how noble in reason, how express and admirable in action, how like an angel, in an apprehension, how like a god, the beauty of the world, the paragon of animals, and yet to me, what is this quintessence of dust? So even though man is like an angel, like a god, the paragon of animals, ultimately man is mud, man is dust. So it's not as hopeful as it seems. This segues into Rosencrantz and Guildenstern telling them that the players are coming. Now everybody around Hamlet is acting. Hamlet is acting. Hamlet's acting a role. And yet here we have some guys who do it for a living. And that's probably why they're there. They're there because you can actually see somebody who is acting and is intentionally acting. Um, Hamlet, when the, when the players come in, um, actually refers to all of them. He knows them all well. Um, he makes a lot of jokes. He um, makes a reference to the young lady and mistress, who, of course, would have been a boy playing girls' roles, and that he has risen up by the height of a chopine. He's gotten taller by the height of a platform clogged shoe. And the question is, is his voice cracked within the ring? Has, he, um, has his voice cracked? Has he lost his high alto voice? And then he asks for a passionate speech. Why does he ask for this particular speech? Well, there's a couple of reasons he asks for this particular speech. It's supposed to be Aeneas' speech to Dido, and it is a speech in which um, Aeneas is describing Pyrrhus murdering King Priam and the distress of Queen Hecuba. Hamlet picks this speech partly, I suspect, because it is a speech about a son avenging his father. And it's very bloody. There's a point in there where Pyrrhus pauses with his sword, thinks about not killing Priam, and then proceeds to do so. Um, the other thing is there is a play by Christopher Marlowe called Dido, Queen of Carthage. Marlowe was pretty much the house playwright of the Admiral's Men, and this just sounds exactly like something Marlowe would write. So it's like Shakespeare trying to imitate Christopher Marlowe and one of his plays. It's almost as though this little troupe of actors really is the Admiral's Men coming in. And they are sent off by Hamlet. Hamlet actually says, can you do the murder of Gonzago? Can you stick in a speech of some dozen or sixteen lines for me? 
Now, we now know, that, or we think anyway, that the Renaissance, and the Renaissance actors studied their lines by themselves. They were good at quick memorization. They didn't really do a lot of rehearsal. So quick memorization and sticking in a sudden, you know, tiny little piece, that would have been nothing to them. Um, Hamlet has a specific purpose for asking for the murder of Gonzago. We will later talk about what dozen and six or sixteen lines does he in fact mean. Um, also, Hamlet um, starts to talk about how this actor, how wonderful this actor is, that he is able to completely convey um, distress and grief about Hecuba's death, and yet, of course, he doesn't know who Hecuba is. He really has never met her before. And Hamlet says, I can't even act that. I can't do anything. Oh, what a rogue and pleasant peasant slave am I. Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, could force his soul so to his own conceit that from her working all the visage wand, a bro tears in his eyes, distraction in his aspect, a broken voice in his whole function suiting with forms to his conceit? And all for nothing, for Hecuba. What's Hecuba to him or he to Hecuba that he should mourn for her? So, on the one hand, he's praising this actor at his ability, and um, the lead actor of the Admiral's Men, Ad Edward Allen, was known for his very dramatic scenery-chewing capacity. Um, the main actor of the Globe Theater of the Chamberlain's Men was Richard Burbage, and so 400 years ago, this would have been Richard Burbage standing on the stage saying, wasn't he good? Wow, I wish I could act like that. I just can't act. And when that happens, every time that happens, we invest a little more into Hamlet not being an actor, but being a real person. And we start to have to think about appearance versus reality again. What's a lie and what's the truth? The other question is, why does Hamlet want the murder of Gonzago? Why does he set this up? Well, he thinks that He's not, he can't believe the ghost. He can't trust himself because one of the symptoms of melancholy is not to trust himself and yet he knows that he could have fantasized the whole thing. So what Hamlet does is set up a scientific double blind test. This play is about a murder. If in fact he does the play and Claudius looks guilty, then he'll know. And he also has to act ask someone who is not biased, Horatio, to observe this. And that is the beginning of this sort of scientific approach to life, science and experiments being something that was becoming popular in the Renaissance. So this is how he approaches this. Murder, though it have no tongue, will speak with most miraculous organ. I'll have these players play something like the murder of my father before mine uncle. I'll observe his looks. I'll tent him to the quick. If he do blench, I know my course. The spirit that I have seen may be a devil, and the devil hath power to assume a pleasing shape, yea, and perhaps out of my weakness and my melancholy, as he is very potent with such spirits, he abuses me to damn me. I'll have grounds more relative than this. The play's the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. So... That is how he's going to go about it, is to set up this test. I'll have grounds. Unlike the usual revenger who sets off with his dagger to kill somebody immediately, Hamlet wants grounds. Well, if Act 2 is the theater act, Act 3 is really the spy act. Some of the theatrical things continue. We'll see the murder of Gonzago is the way it's staged. We'll get to see some references to Renaissance acting and theater, and there are a lot of theatrical references. So let's plan on looking at that in Act 3, and I'll see you in a moment or two.